This morning we're just um, going to look at just two verses and we are going to consider what these verses, uh, we're going to consider what these verses are actually saying uh, in the text, but I I do want to do some preliminary things. But let's begin with uh, reading the text in John chapter 14, uh, verses 13 and 14. Okay, this is what uh, Jesus tells his disciples in the Uh, Upper Room Discourse. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, Those are very encouraging words. I hope we, um, uh, as it were, cash in on those promises uh, often. But I do think we need to understand what what it is that Jesus is saying, and that's really what the purpose is. Of, of the sermon is, is about. Now, if I was to ask um, which of all the meetings of the church is the least popular, and this would be true of any, in any particular church, between the morning service and the evening service and the midweek prayer meeting, which would you say is the, is the least popular? Well, I think we all know that it is the, the prayer meeting, right? At least in those churches that actually still have them, Uh, They are so unpopular that many churches have really discontinued them because not many people come. As a matter of fact, uh, years ago when Donna and I were a part of a a mega church, it was a a Calvary Chapel, uh, there were two morning services in an auditorium that held 1,200 people, and there was an evening service that held, uh, well, again, in the same place, one evening service that was relatively full, so 2,400 people coming in the morning, 1,200 in the evening. But there was also a prayer meeting before the evening service, and you want to guess how many people came to that? About 60, I think, 60 people. Uh, again, why? Well, because the prayer meeting isn't very popular. You know, many years ago, we, um, we didn't have that prayer meeting before the morning service, and we decided we really needed to, to have more prayer, and so the elders decided to establish that prayer meeting. Now, this is many years ago. I think most of you weren't perhaps here at the time, but some of the members complained. They complain because, you know, you can't get us to come to the midweek meeting, so now you're going to move it to Sunday when we're here so that we have to attend, okay? That, that, was, that was the response. It, again, not a popular thing. And then several years ago, we also, when we saw that the Wednesday prayer meetings weren't being very well attended and were dwindling, we decided to try to encourage attendance by adding the Bible study to it because people, you know, like to study the Bible, I think, more than prayer. Prayer meetings are not very popular, and we need to ask the question, why is that? Well, it, it, they're not popular because they're hard work, right? I mean, it is hard work. We have to overcome our flesh in order to do it. But the reason why ultimately is because of spiritual warfare. I mean, the things that are most useful, the things that are most threatening to the enemy are the things he is going to attack the most, and this is what he attacks. That should tell us something. Now, every meeting of the church is important. What we're doing right now is important. Worship is important. It builds us up. It it informs us. We learn things from this. It encourages us, at least it ought to. And fellowship, getting together as the body of Christ can do the same thing, and that's why Satan and our flesh also try to keep us away from these things, But why does he attack prayer in particular? And the reason is simply this, as I've already mentioned, because this, more than anything else, is a threat to him. At least it is when we pray as our Lord calls us to pray in his word. Uh, William Cooper, who along with John Newton was was the author of the only hymns, describes it or puts it in this way in his hymn that we're going to sing at the end of the evening service, what various hindrances we meet. And he's talking about when we, when we, when we start moving towards prayer, we get all these things that stand in our way. Well, this is one thing he says, and this is the reason why we meet all these hindrances. He says, restraining prayer, we cease to fight. And what he means by that is if we hold back from praying, then we've actually stopped fighting against <laughs> Satan. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright. It equips us. But listen to this. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. 
This is a real threat to the enemy, and that's why he attacks us at this point. Now, what we want to look at today is what kind of prayer are we actually talking about here? Is he, are we talking about the kind of prayer where, you know, uh, maybe, again, before meals or you, you, meet, you hear about a particular need and so you, you lift up a brief prayer? That isn't the kind of prayer we're talking about. What we're talking about the kind of prayer that Jesus actually tells us to pray. So we want to look at this morning at what this prayer actually is, and then this evening, why it is that the devil sees it as such a threat. So first of all, let's look at prayer. Now, I think we all tend to take it for granted, I, certainly I do, that we have a handle on prayer, that we know what it is. I mean, if there's anything we know, we know prayer. But the question we need to ask is, is it simply asking the Lord for the things that we need? Well, at first glance, our passage almost appears to, to tell us that because Jesus says, again, in John 14, verses 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, there you have it. It's, a, it's called the blank check, right? Jesus gives you the blank check. Just fill in whatever you want, give it to him, cash it in heaven and so forth. Well, that's true. I mean, he has given us somewhat of a blank check. But prayer is really much more than that, and it's the much more that we need to consider as well as the blank check. Prayer is how we nurture our relationship with the Lord. You know, it's been called, in a certain sense, the spiritual breath of the Christian. If you're not breathing, you're not alive, you know, humanly speaking. And if you're not praying, you're not spiritually alive. So there's a certain sense in which it is a sign of life, but it is also how we cultivate our relationship with the Lord. It's how we spend time with Him. As a matter of fact, that's how we cultivate every relationship that we have, isn't it? You can't have a relationship with someone if you don't spend time with them. But for some reason, we seem to think we don't have to do that so much with the Lord. Now, when we first trusted Jesus, we came into a new relationship with the Father and with Him, through Him, that we didn't have before. Uh, the only way that we could enter was through Jesus. But we do need to, to understand this. When we first came to Jesus, we were absolute strangers to Him. We were His enemies, right? We, we didn't know anything about Him, really. We didn't want to know Him. But Jesus, through the gospel, entered into a very intimate relationship with us. He is our husband, and we are his bride through the gospel. The Bible also says that we were in Satan's family, in his kingdom. And the Father took us out of that kingdom and adopted us as his sons and daughters through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have this new intimate relationship with the Lord. But entering into these new family connections was meant to be just the beginning rather than the end. Now, maybe we thought it was the end, and, and oftentimes many who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ see it as the end. I've come to Jesus. I'm in this relationship. I'm safe now from judgment. I'm in the family of God. He's never going to kick me out of the family. I'm going to go to heaven. So now I can just go about my business. I really don't need to get to know him. But we do need to realize Jesus did not marry us in name only. Jesus wants a relationship with us, right? And the same is true of the Father, okay? They both want us to get to know them more intimately. And the only way we can really go deeper in that relationship with them is by spending time with them. That's one of the reasons I've said before we meet together here to worship we're not meeting just to sing songs and to read portions of Scripture and to hear a message and, and so forth, but we're here to connect with God, with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit through these things and to build our relationship with Him, to draw near to Him. You see, that is the purpose of worship, and if we don't understand that, what, what happens to it? It turns into formalism, and formalism simply means that we're going through the forms. You know, we, outwardly, we look like we're doing the right things, but there isn't the inward reality. There isn't the love. There isn't the desire to connect with the Lord. That's what we need to be seeking, and if we're not doing that, we're not going to get the benefit 
of the Lord wants us to have through our worship. But now there's another way that we can connect with the Lord wherever we go and whatever we're doing, and that is through prayer. Because prayer is, is really first and foremost fellowship with the Lord. It's communion with the Lord. When we're praying, what are we doing? Well, for one thing, we're talking to Him. And the Lord also talks to us. He, he doesn't talk to us through, you know, voices, audible voices we hear or impressions necessarily, but through His Word. You know, we have His Word here in, in, in the Bible, but we've been reading this Word and we have it here too. And oftentimes we'll pray and the Lord will respond by bringing a verse to mind that will have the answer to the question that we're seeking. So there's a discussion, a, a dialogue that's going on. But we need to ask this question, what is it that we should be talking to the Lord about? Um, should it be, Lord, I want this and I want this and I want this and this and this and thank you very much in the name of Jesus, right? Well, sometimes that's kind of the way we treat the Lord, but would we do that in the other relationships that we have? You know, let's say you come up to your friend, I want you to do this, 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 this for me. Thank you, you know. We are not going to have that relationship for very long because people don't like to be treated that way. The Lord wants more than that. So what goes into this relationship? Well, what I'm going to do is just simply expound what you already know, acts, remember? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, that's the summary of, of prayer, but we need to see this in a relational way. We need to adore Him. We need to tell Him that we love Him. You know, you want to see expressions of love, read the Psalms. The Psalms are songs, but they're also prayers, prayers from the heart of King David and the love that he expressed toward the Lord as well as others who wrote the Psalms. We, we find expressions like this in, in Psalm 18, verse 1, where David writes this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I hope that in our prayers we have been telling the Lord we love him. He also says in Psalm 26, verse 8, O Lord... I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. He was talking about the tabernacle. And then with you know, the building of the temple, that would have been the place. But now there is no tabernacle or temple, but there is a spiritual house, and that's the people of God. And this is the place where God's glory dwells. I love you, Lord, and I love where your glory is revealed and expressed. Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. So how can we spend time with the Lord and not tell Him that we love Him? How can we not tell Him also what it is about Him that we love? David writes in Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. To ascribe to the Lord glory that is due to Him is essentially His glory is the expression of who He is. It's His character. It's everything about Him that is good and glorious. And we tell Him, Lord, You are glorious. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are powerful. And we ascribe to Him all the things that are true about Him. That is why we love Him, particularly His holiness. We should tell him how thankful we are for what it is he has already done for us. The psalmist writes in Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. I mean, think about what he does or what he has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, what the table reminds us of this morning. We were lost. We were without hope. We were on our way to hell. There was nothing we could do about it. There was nothing we wanted to do about it. But He saved us through His Son. We should thank Him every day for that. And we should thank Him for what He continues to do for us. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord the humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Now that applies to worship, but it also applies to what we do during the course of the day as we are 
walking about and doing the things that we're doing, we should bless the Lord at all times. Watts writes in a very familiar hymn, O oh, bless the Lord my soul, nor let his mercies lie, forgotten in unthankfulness and without praises die. So we should adore him, we should thank him, but we should also tell him how sorry we are for how we often treat him in the face of all the grace and the goodness that he shows to us. We should confess our sins to the Lord. David writes in Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, when we offend people with, with whom we're in relationship, especially those who are closest to us, what is it we have to do before that relationship is restored? We need to ask forgiveness, right? Well, we know that when we ask forgiveness from the Lord, He is going to grant us that forgiveness. But we do need to ask because John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The assumption here is we are going to be confessing our sins like we would in any relationship. But we need to do this with the Lord. And that's what prayer is all about, adoration, thanksgiving, confession. But now after we've spent um, quality time with him doing these things, then we can ask him for the things that we need. One of the great benefits that comes from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is the promise that we read earlier, which I'll read again in John 14, verses 13 and 14. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What a glorious promise. We can ask for whatever we want, and Jesus says he will do it for us. Now, we do need to pay attention, though, to what it is he says here and what he says in other places. First of all, he tells us that we do need to ask in his name. We can ask for whatever we want in his name, but what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that we can't come to the Lord in our own name. We don't deserve to come to him. Lord, hear my prayer and answer my prayer on the basis of what I have done. You know, we, we can't do that because what have we done? Well, before we came to the Lord, all we did was, you know, sin. Having come to the Lord, even though there are, you know, there, there's some real desire to love and honor the Lord and the things we do, they're still tainted with sin, and they cannot form the grounds or the basis upon which the Lord would hear us. But we can ask in the name of Jesus because of what He has done, because of what He deserves. He's the one who did the work. He's the one who deserves this reward to be heard by His Father and Jesus here is giving that privilege to us. We can come in his name. He says, just tell him, I sent you, okay? And then the Father will receive you, and he will give you what it is you're asking for. But there's another sense in which it, it, Jesus means to ask in his name. It also means to ask for what we believe from his word that he wants us to ask. It means putting him first. It means putting his concerns first. And we also see that in, in the Psalms. Think about it again what David writes in Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I was in a health and wealth church for many years, and I heard this verse quoted many, many times. And do you suppose they had any idea what it meant? All they saw was he will give you the desires of your heart if you just basically delight yourself in him. So, okay, I'll work up some delight. And then God will give me what I want. Well, that's not what this means. It means you need to love him. He needs to be the center of your life. He needs to be your delight. And you need to delight in the things that delight him. And when your heart is in that kind of a state, yes, you can ask. And he'll, of course, he'll give you what you want because what you want is what he wants. That's the way this works. 
It's exactly what Jesus means when he says in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You put my concerns first, Jesus says, then the Father will put your concerns first in, in his life. I mean, as far as what he will do for you. You need to put the kingdom first. Now, as I mentioned before, as we were reading through the Lord's Prayer, this is exactly the pattern Jesus gives us, right? It puts the Lord's concerns first. Seek his kingdom first. He says in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10, this is the way you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means that his name would be reverenced, treated as holy. Where? Everywhere, throughout the world. Your kingdom come. Well, what kingdom is this? Well, this is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one that Jesus commissioned us to go out and be the ambassadors of, make disciples of all the nations, spread the kingdom throughout the world. This is a prayer that that kingdom would advance. Your kingdom come with, with power and spread through the world. And then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is not really a prayer that God's secret plan would be fulfilled. That's going to be fulfilled anyway. But this is a prayer that God's declared will would be done on earth. That is that we and all men would obey him and essentially love him and love one another as he calls us to as his will is done in heaven the way the angels and the saints do. We're asking for heaven on earth. These are the Lord's concerns that we are to put first. And then t Jesus tells us after we've done that, then we can pray for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread in which everything is included. And forgive us our debts, our sins, our debts to your justice as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And by the way, when Jesus says, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, he means exactly what it says. Lord, forgive me in the way that I have forgiven those who have offended me. That's, that's scary, isn't it? But Jesus goes on to say, if we don't forgive others their offenses against us, our Father won't forgive us. Now, he doesn't mean that we have to forgive in order to receive forgiveness. It's a work we do in order to receive forgiveness. It's not a work salvation. But what he is implying here is simply this, that if we have experienced the grace of God and we've had our 10,000 talents of debt to his justice removed, we will forgive those that have committed the small offenses against us and we won't you know, require them to basically or exact from them everything that their sins deserve. Like the man who took the servant who owed him one or two days wages and had him thrown into prison when his Lord had just forgiven him 10,000 talents. We need to be those who forgive. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, as it were. Remember when Peter was walking on the water, had his eyes fastened on Jesus, began to look at the storm, began to sink, he didn't say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm thankful for everything you've done. Lord, I confess my sins. He didn't do that. He said, Jesus, save me. I mean, that's, he just immediately cried out. Now, there are going to be those cases where we have to do that. But those are the exceptions. Those are not the rule. The rule is we need to spend time with the Lord, and we need to put his concerns first. Now, two final things I just want to mention. We need to pray believing. Remember, faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's what author to the Hebrews says. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. We have to believe, you know, and it has to be, again, the saving faith, the kind that loves the Lord and delights in him, desires that his will be done. And we need to pray Forgiving, I've already mentioned uh, that passage, but let me read a parallel passage in Mark 11, verses 25 through 26, where Jesus says the same thing, but he says it a slightly different way. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Now, if we will do these things, again, if we will adore Him, 
And by the way, I should mention, adoring him is, is expressing in words, but one wonderful way to do this is to sing hymns of praise and, and hymns of love, psalms of love to the Lord. There's plenty of good songs out there. Worship the Lord, adore him, thank him, confess your sins to him, and then begin asking for the things you need, but put his concerns first and your concerns second. If you do this and you do it in faith and you do it forgiving, then the Lord says He will hear us and He will give us the things that we have asked, but He will do it in His time and He will do it in a way that makes it obvious that it comes from Him so that He receives all the glory. Let's be encouraged this morning to pray, okay? Not, again, not just to give God our list, but to pray in the way that He's called us to pray. And we're going to see this evening why it's important that we do these things and why it is that Satan hates this and why he does everything he does and why the flesh, the, the sins inside of us, will do everything it can to stop us from praying in this way. And it's because it is a real threat to Him, but only when we pray in this way. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us um, to learn to pray.